Well, thank you for coming to Pro Seminar. <laughs> so, all right, folks. Uh, we are about to switch over to the second half of Pro Seminar, which is the colloquium, which I am pleased to present you with uh, Dr. Joe Ho, and he's going to talk about um, the Health Informatics Research Projects the Health Lab. And I'm going to just slightly close this door. I think some folks will be coming in, so I don't want to shut it. I don't. Okay? Um, great. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, hope everyone's doing fine. Um, Friday. It's almost the end of a week. Um, and I'm very happy and, and pleasure to um, be here presenting some of our recent projects um, in the eHealth Lab. Um, it's, it has been quite a busy year for us. We have been doing a lot of work, and uh, most of this work has been attributed to, uh, attributed to my students who are doing a really, really amazing job uh, in presenting their research in different ways, uh, like attending conferences, publishing journals, and I'm feeling very excited to be involved in those activities. Um, and in this particular presentation, I want to um, like give you a broad overview of what's going on with the lab. Um, and also, I want to give you some specific details on the recent project recently uh, funded by the National Institute, Institute of Health. So um, you will have, have some idea about how we can, like, uh, you know, work towards a grant uh, grant funding proposal. And uh, after we get funding proposal, how can we do about it? You know, how how can we deliver the results? So I think I want to share a lot of uh, some details with some experiences. So of course, um, you know, it's always great if you can ask a lot of questions so we can be a little bit more interactive. I probably have prepared much more than um, the, a lot of time for this, but um, I probably will skip some of those because maybe you're not that much interested in those details. But I just want to make this very uh, interactive and engaging. So I want to talk about first what is biomedical and health informatics and also give um, some ideas about what's, uh, what's going on with the research lab and also um, the progress of this one. So um, I think probably some of you have attended uh, the course that Laura uh, presented yesterday, right? So you, you gave some great idea. And I did some modifications to these slides. I feel like we probably need to make some modifications. Um, there are actually uh, different kind of uh, concepts, uh, like definitions for biomedical and health informatics because it's very, very fastly growing. And uh, we have, I found a few uh, which I want to share with you. Um, informatics is a discipline dedicated to the systematic processing of data, information, knowledge in the medicine and healthcare. And uh, another like, agency defined informatics as intersection of information science, which is quite relevant to us, computer science and healthcare. This field deals with the resources, devices, and methods required to optimize the acquisition, storage, retrieval, and use of information in health and uh, biomedicine. So you can see that this actually um, encompasses a lot of different aspects, information processing, storage, um, understanding, analysis, um, visualization. So it's a very broad field. And because we have only limited amount of um, efforts to tackle a very specific things, so um, we're not going to do that much. But I'm very like you know happy that we actually are doing something which is cross disciplinary and cross disciplinary research and. Uh, Based on the category definition of American Medical Informatics Association, the medical informatics or health informatics can be subdivided into several special specialties, like translational bioinformatics are pretty much more um, dealing with translating biomedical and uh, genomic data into knowledge. So their data sets are more on the genomic and the biological side. And the clinical research informatics um, is pretty much dealing with the secondary reuse of electronic health record data from like, hospitals and how to design clinical trials. And this is part of our expertise here in this lab. And the clinical informatics are more dealing with the clinical workflow, how to use knowledge, and how to use um, ways to process and to improve the process of clinical workflow to make sure that people are getting faster uh, in their treatment and uh, you know, in, their, in their healthcare. So, we don't deal with that because in FSU we don't have a teaching hospital, so it's not really our best, uh, like you know, uh, kind of approach to deal with clinical informatics. So uh, that is pretty much not really our focus. But we do focus on health, consumer health informatics because um, a lot of our students here are very interested in uh, consumer health uh, information seeking behavior and health information understanding. So we do a lot of research in this particular sub area. So I would say that our focus is pretty much on 
consumer health informatics, and clinical research informatics. And right now, because there's a lot of data that is being collected from different sources that can be used to mine information for healthcare. So now there's like more of a vague boundary between health informatics and the health data, big data science. So a lot of people that are right now doing a lot of data science related research in collaboration with computer scientists, with information scientists, and also with medical professionals. So it's also a very exciting field because you can really see how this type of um, technique can revolutionize medicine. And as I mentioned, this is our focused area. And uh, in the recent uh, a few years, we have done quite a lot of job. And I personally, um, I have several funding research, and uh, one of the funding research is dealing with clinical trial generalizability, which is trying to improve clinical trial design to make sure that what's being invested in clinical trials can be more generalizable to the rural population. And also, I'm really interested in like how do we better facilitate consumer health information seeking, because many patients, when they um, are in the clinical workflow, they feel like the information they get from, um, from their medical professionals through patient portals or other type of uh, electronic format may not be readily analyzable, uh, readily understandable. So they have a very hard time dealing with, you know, uh, communicating with professionals and uh, making sure that they can use the information to make better health decisions. So we want to make sure that we can improve the ways that they can better communicate through understanding their language barriers and also through better providing providing better uh, and more contextualized information to healthcare uh, in, in the, through their health portals. And also I do research with uh, artificial intelligence medicine doing prediction models using uh, machine learning methods and some deep learning methods to build models to improve the health, health outcome prediction. For example, right now we're working on, um, on like predicting patient mortality uh, within uh, complex or diseases patients. And also we do readmission prediction using electronic compressor data. And my student, Laura, who is sitting here, and she actually um, involved in a lot of activities in this lab. And when, when she was a master's student in, uh, in the program, she took a course with, with me in a course uh, we actually did a project related to predicting patient mortality prediction. So in that particular project, she did really well, and later we published paper in the American Medical Informatics Association uh, in Frank Summit, which is great. And later, she uh, was interested in this program and uh, continue, want to continue to be a doctoral student. So we luckily have her here. And recently, um, Laura has expressed a lot of interest in health information seeking behavior and health information behavior. So we got her um, involved in several activities, uh, analyzing, for example, the perceptions of health, um, like health uh, about better supplements use and their perceptions of their perceived benefits. The difference, uh, there are a lot of disparities in that. So we still use some national survey data, for example, National Nutrition Health Disaster Survey, which is a CDC um, uh, survey to analyze their differences. Um, and we're working together with our friends at the University, the University of Minnesota, um, who have another um, grant funded project to investigate the uh, like the disparities in the knowledge basis of that. And also, there's a recent new um, one opportunity um, published by America, by National Library of Medicine, which is part of the National Institute of Health, where uh, the idea is to promote the development of personal health libraries for different patient population. And the idea is that patients have a difficult time to navigate the information on the web or from different sources. So how can we help them better uh, build this personalized health library to get information they need and be able to contextualize this information uh, with their condition and make better decisions. Um, they should be able to share this knowledge and annotate the information to other peers who experience the same situation. So now we're, we're doing some preliminary work. Hopefully we can prepare a grant proposal next year for this particular call. And another student, uh, Neil Farber, wrote that theory, and she's very interested in explainable artificial intelligence medicine. And the idea is because even though we have very fancy techniques like neural deep neural networks, which can simulate human brain to um, understand ways to predict you know, mortality or readmission among different patient population, but a lot of these models are lacking certain level of explainability or interpretability. And if you show the results to your doctors, the doctors may not be easily understanding the, you know, the why you make such predictions. So we want to sh make sure that we can, for example, uh, like identify the most important features used in predictions and providing those information to doctors so they can make better informed decisions about your prediction model. And uh, she's developing her research agenda. All of this problem, all of this, uh, like, like uh, 
particular um, like uh, problem, and we're working with professors from um, uh, like College of Medicine, who is also a cardiovascular um, cardiologist from Al Hospital, to serve as a medical professional expert in this area. Um, and uh, she's also has a good relationship with professors from University of Melbourne and University of Melbourne, AI. So there's a very interesting collaboration out there. And uh, Lynette Girillo, uh, who has been here for quite a while, and uh, she uh, is very interested in the risk um, factors associated with health information seeking and uh, cancer clinical trial participation. And uh, she has a very good uh, uh, research agenda. I worked with, with her starting uh, like two or three years ago, and uh, she already finished her prospectus defense. And right now, she's working towards her dissertation defense um, using, uh, like there are several stages. Uh, in the first stage, we're using uh, publicly available survey data to understand, for example, the disparity, like the disparities between different uh, population in different age group, and trying to understand how this difference may impact their interest in medic medical research. And recently, we have this paper published and accepted by uh, Journal of Medical Internet Research, which should be appear, which should appear next Monday. So um, you know, I will send a link to you guys later on if you, know, you, are, if you are interested in that different work. And uh, we're also interested in looking at um, how we can survey the patients with potentially cancer diagnosis and uh, look at their um, risk, um, like perceived risk associated with clinical trial participation. So there are a few interesting projects. And we do have a bi-weekly meeting. So usually bi-weekly, uh, every other Friday, we have a meeting in uh, the Innovation Hub. So my students from high school, and also I have some other students from uh, statistics, from communication, um, they all join this lab meetings. So we talk about research, we talk about activities, um, you know, opportunities to submit your work in different conferences and journals. I think those could be, um, you know, I think a very good venue to discuss, uh, you know, uh, potential collaborations, uh, you know, among our students. Uh, and also sometimes we we'll have a fun gathering, uh, like recently, because last year we have these two amazing um, visiting scholars from China, and they joined our lab and attended those activities, and they wrote a big paper together, and recently uh, they left for uh, their uh, studies in China, so we had a pretty uh, nice gathering um, in a restaurant. And we all have a pretty uh, productive uh, publication record. Um, this year we have uh, nine conference papers published and also six journal publica publication. And uh, like this only shows the selected uh, publications we have made this year. So as I mentioned, we not just published paper in JNIR, which is one of the first journal in medical and health informatics. Um, and uh, I also recently gonna have another publication with a professor, Dr. Liu, and uh, the student, uh, San Lin and Daniel from Computer Science Department. And we're going to uh, publish this paper on biomedical work sensitive ambiguation in BMC bioinformatics. I'll talk a little bit more detail about that research project. Um, and I have funny research from NIH, so I have to publish papers to uh, serve as a result for that, for, that, uh, uh, for that grant. So I had some papers recently published in American Medical Informatics Association, uh, which will be presented uh, next month in Washington, D.C. Uh, and earlier in this year in San Francisco, we also have another paper published in EMEA 2019 Informatics Summit. So, um, Lynette and uh, uh, Anil Omar and Laura, they have like, presented um, and their work in uh, EMEA 2019 Informatics Summit and Medieval 2019. So, we have a lot of really exciting activities um, and hopefully giving them opportunities to uh, present their research, especially also exchanging their ideas with their uh, colleagues and uh, you know, friends in other institutions. So I think, um, you know, if you have opportunities, I do encourage you to go attend those conferences. Um, I'm sure Laura will have a lot of things to say about that. And she has a, you know, amazing experience in that experience. So if I could, I would uh, be very happy to support students to present research on the those project. So if there are some interesting research uh, projects that I want to show to you, um, just to give you some brief idea. So, uh, for example, uh, Laura and and the, and, the, uh, and the Nilofar, um, in Medinfo this year, they published this paper using uh, the publicly available medical record data from MIMI3, which is uh, uh, electronic data from uh, Boston, from, from a hospital in Boston. And they have a data set with about 12 years of data containing over 53,000 patients. So they're using this data set and uh, identifying the patients who have diagnosis with myocardial infarction and acute myocardial infarction syndrome, 
and then they extracted different types of structured data from the patient record, including the treatment that the patient had gone, the kind of different comorbidities the patient had, the different lab tests the patient had uh, like tested, and also the demographic data of the patients regarding their age, gender, race, and ethnicity. Um, and also that this is what we call structured data because they are clearly um, defined and uh, like uh, structured in the database. But uh, in the EHR data, there are also a bunch of data that are not well structured. They are free text data. So we also look at their discharge summary report, which basically describes the information that what kind of information. Well, it's a very rich information uh, describing their diagnosis, their this, like their um, procedures and symptoms that are like uh, um, like uh, uh, human by the by the, by the patients. So we use a uh, we use uh, some natural processing techniques extracting the word uh, embedding features from the discharge summaries and then combine this type of data and uh, set them in different type, different kind of machine learning algorithms and evaluate how we can predict patient mortality within, within one year. And uh, the results actually are pretty, pretty promising. If we use deep learning methods, uh, which are very simple, uh, multi-layer, fully connected uh, deep learning network, um, we can identify 92% of the of accurate, like accurate, we have a 92% accuracy for predicting patient mortality in one year, which is uh, considered to be very good uh, compared to the other type of methods presented in other journal papers. And uh, we also describe our um, detailed uh, like, uh, analysis by combining the free text data with different type of structured data. And they all show pretty promising results. And we found that if you combine free text data with um, with uh, demographic data, uh, the F measure, which is a uh, uh, common mean of precision recall, shows a pretty good uh, performance. And in this recent publication, we're going to publish recently in BMC Bioinformatics, we're trying to work on this um, idea of how can we use the context of a text to tell the exact meaning of a particular word. And this is actually a very important problem when you deal with natural understanding. Um, and for example, in biomedicine, it's very common that a word may have different meaning in the in text. For example, like a code, a C-O-L-D, this word could mean the temperature code, right? It could also mean that you have a cold disease, uh, your cold. And it also could mean another disease called a commonary um, uh, chronic obstructive lung disease. So because of that different, uh, different uh, complexity, so we can use the context of all the text to approximate, like, approximate the actual meaning of a particular uh, word. So the students, um, they did a great job. They tried a different type of uh, like artificial intelligence methods, uh, like bi-directional long, long short-term memory network and attention-based neural network, which are very uh, shown promising results in different types of uh, learning uh, and text mining techniques uh, applications. And they built this very fancy um, uh, bidirectional uh, LSTM uh, network to um, un understand the context. For example, in this particular sentence, like John received a malaria vaccine, and in this particular context, we have this word malaria, which would be an ambiguous word. So we're trying to detect the actual meaning of this word. So we kind of put this context of word into this network, and then we connect it to the output of different layers into this exponent layer, and then detect, and then uh, like decide what is the correct meaning of that word. But of course, because we could not uh, you know, detect the word without the training data, so we actually have training data uh, published, using training data published by uh, National Health Medicine. They give you a, a chunk of text from, uh, uh, which are extracted text from PubMed, and each text they have annotated word, and they give you actual meaning of the word, um, which is used, which is uh, using, uh, which use a uh, concept unique identifier of the unified medical memory system. Uh, and then we can use that as a training data to, to train the model, and then use that to make predictions. And if uh, we try different type of contamination methods to contaminate output of different network into uh, 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 like, uh, the output layer, and then we try different combinations, and uh, the accuracy um, is pretty good. It's very, very high. Like 96% of the time, we can accurately predict the meaning of a particular word. So, you can see that some of this word here are pretty difficult to understand, you know, even without without context, because there are uh, like uh, acronyms and there are abbreviations, so they could be different things. But um, you know, compared to the baseline methods here, our methods uh, are performing uh, 
better uh, in terms of accuracy compared to other type of methods. So here I just want to give you some ideas. We'll also do some qualitative study in the research lab um, because, uh, as I mentioned, we're interested in how CPU and CPU behavior of patients. So we're interested right now to look at how we can use um, social media text or social media posting to understand the patient's uh, concerns regarding their lab test result. Um, because uh, the idea is, when you see the patient's lab test result um, in your lab, in your patient portals, you may not fully understand those information. So uh, you may want to ask information, ask questions online. So they might go to uh, social media like Yahoo Answers or other social Q&A websites to ask, for example, okay, this is my glucose value and how can I understand it? What does it really mean? So we want to know what kind of concern the patient has. So we look at um, the answer data. We extracted 8,000 questions, um, and we focus on only on questions related to type 2 diabetes, because we thought that this is a very critical disease that may lead to other complications. So we want to know what is the real um, you know, problem with patients understanding the lab test. So we use those different search terms. Some, some search terms are more generic, like lab, laboratory, and some other terms may be more specific to particular lab results. For example, A1C, glucose, blood pressure, and the creatinine. So we follow a very rigorous um, you know, uh, coding uh, procedure. Um, two coders develop a code book. They independently code uh, 240 uh, posts um, extracted from social media. And then they develop a code book, and then exact they examine the exhaustiveness of the code book uh, using additional 100 samples, and uh, they continue doing that until a saturation uh, is reached that no more codes can be identified. So uh, we also measure inter-rater reliability, which shows significant over like significant agreements between these uh, uh, like independent raters. And then they can separately after this uh, agreement is high, they can separately call the rest of the data. So in total, we code we coded. 1619 posts. So we categorize those different posts in different categories. So the most important category would be they want to understand the meaning of the lab test result. For example, a patient may ask, is GFR of 73 and creatinine of 1.1 normal? So many people ask this type of question. And also some patients, they may have problems understanding patient a doctor's diagnosis. Like this patient said, why do I need to test my creatinine level every three months as being suggested by the doctor? So it shows that patients may not have fully trust, may not fully trust their doctors. So they may want to consult other sources to find information, you know, to confirm the diagnosis or suggestions made by the doctors. And in some patients, they just want to have some basic idea about the lab test results. For example, they may say, "What is creatinine cholesterol?" For example, they may say, uh, "If I will test my glucose tomorrow, do I need to fast, and how long shall I fast?" So they may ask a lot of questions like that. And some people also consult next step. Um, if they um, have already been diagnosed with, with uh, given a particular lab test result, they may want to ask, what should I do next? Uh, and this patient said, a recent pathology test states that my creatinine is 6.28. Uh, they require the, uh, dialysis to be done. What can, be, what can cure this high level? So we found a lot of interesting results from this qualitative study. Um, and right now, we're also doing a several step, you know, additional step based on this. For example, we want to know, um, you know, when they ask those questions, what kind of information do they provide? Because uh, if you want to ask questions, you may want to probably provide some other information. For example, your your dietary, your your diet, your um, you know, food intake, nutrition intake, your exercise to help people better understand your, your situation. So. We want to analyze the, those kind of um, information seeking behavior. So in the future, we can um, suggest, make suggestions, or even build a protocol for patient health record to provide those information, uh, using the patient information to make personalized recommendations for the uh, next step regarding particular lab results. So we currently have three funded research projects. Um, the first project is really funded by the National Institute, Institute of Aging, and we're collaborating with uh, other colleagues in the FSU, including Dr. Waterboot, a uh, professor from the psychology department, and doc, uh, Dr. Sharok um, uh, 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 Chakraborty from uh, computer science, and, other, and other, several other professors from other departments. And I'll talk about a little bit more detail. And uh, we're going to get uh, another pilot grant funded by the National, National Center for Translational, uh, Advanced Translational Sciences, which is a sub-award by UF and FSU's Clinical Translational Science Award. 
to uh, build models to predict cold transplantation health outcome in pediatric patients. And it's because the idea is many patients, when they are you know, uh, younger than normal, when they are children, when they have you know, transplantations of their organs, they may not comply to the medication for different uh, cold transplant medications. Uh, so, they want to, so we want to know what kind of predictors may cause them to be non-compliant or not adhering, not adhering to those different treatments um, and uh, make suggestions and recommendations. And I'm currently um, still working on my uh, Department 1, Department 1, which is systematic analysis and clinical trial, and I'm building assessment methods with informatics, uh, which I'm going to give a lot more detail uh, in the next 30 minutes. Um, so for this um, app project, um, the idea is um, many people, uh, they are, there are many different type of uh, cognitive assessment uh, um, games or, or apps um, there, um, which help people understand the, their behavior and understand if they have some early symptoms or early um, um, problems that may lead to dementia or Alzheimer's disease in their lifetime. But if you, even if you have those uh, type of mobile apps, if you don't adhere to the treatment plan or testing um, you know, schedule, you may not be able to uh, you know, get benefit, advantage of those apps. So we're trying to see how can we better detect the patient behavior in using the different apps and make like uh, artificial intelligence-based reminders to help them better adhere to this kind of treatment. So this particular treatment is a training um, uh, procedure. Um, it's a tablet-based application. Um, every time you have to finish a, a 45 minute training session, and uh, you do it every week for five five times every week for six months. We can we can know that this is actually pretty uh, you know kind of tough uh, you know task. So people without high motivations, they may not uh, easily adhere to this plan. But we want to give them some recommendations of you know, reminders to follow this procedure so they can do that. So this whole thing, you know, it's not uh, what we develop in the, like with a, from scratch. There is a company called Aptima, which already have this kind of apps already developed. So we're just collaborating with um, and providing some uh, additional functionalities of these apps. And uh, we can send artificial uh, AI reminders uh, to remind those people based on their behavior, their past behavior, and their uh, like location, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll do also a clinical trial based on this intervention and comparing it with the dumb, uh, the human support, for example, sending alert every uh, like every morning at eight o'clock. Um, that is dumb support because we don't have any you know human feedback or any artificial intelligence uh, you know uh, combinations. Um, and we want to compare that with smart uh, human support. Potentially, we can also use some persuasive technologies. Uh, Dr. Mia Lustre is also part of this project as a, a key member. So she's very interested in finding out ways to sending more persuasive messages and more um, um, and to, to the patients so to help them better engage this activity. So this project is a five-year project, which will um, you know we can see some exciting results in the next few years. And uh, then I'm going to kind of quickly go through the recent progress of my RP1 and I want to show you um, some progress and how we can get there. So this project is titled as systematic analysis of clinical trial generalized ability assessment with informatics. And some, some of you may have some familiarities, they may, may be familiar with clinical trials, some are not. So I also want to give you some brief ideas about the background of this type of research, why this is important. Like clinical trials are generally like gold standard evidence, generally gold standard evidence for medicine. So whatever drugs are taken, they have to uh, you're taking they have to go through the clinical trial process. The idea is that um, if you don't go through a clinical trial, you don't know the you know the efficacy of those drugs. You also don't know how how how, how much adverse events the drugs have. And also, we want to balance the trade-off between the dosage of the medicine and the toxicity. And but but well, the half the problem is the clinical trial is very expensive. It normally takes over 15 years and costs over hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to conduct a trial. So if you cannot um, you know, make your trial uh, make your trial population representative of the general population, you may not be able to uh, well test the population and uh, see what kind of adverse drug reactions this patient may have. And especially the, pa the patients who have multiple chronic conditions or who are older and who are who have um, you know like HIV other type of uh, diseases are less likely to be considered by clinical trials. But those people, especially older people with chronic conditions, 
they are usually people who have problems um, in their health. They may take those medicines. So um, you, you, you really don't have the population they need. So, and also, if you use very stringent eligibility criteria to consider patient participation and selection, uh, that may cause all fear because you may not get enough patients in your, in your population. And it may cause early termination, which is also very significant uh, loss of uh, financial loss for their sponsors. So, we want to analyze the ways to improve control drug review. This is our um, general goal for this research. And uh, it's not like we found this problem. Actually, the community all found this is a critical problem that in clinical trials, they are not testing the more representative population than the general population. So researchers uh, in different disease community, they have make a lot of recommendations to help relax the clinical trial eligibility criteria. For example, uh, like this is in 2017, two years ago, there was a special issue published in a uh, like special, like, I think the special issue was something published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, which is focused on cancer uh, treatment um, and cancer, uh, cancer um, uh, prevention treatment. And this journal has four papers published, um, which is including reevaluating eligibility criteria for oncology trials, broadening criteria to make clinical trials more representative, and modernizing clinical trial eligibility criteria. Um, and those papers are like uh, co-authored by academic institutions as well as uh, FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, which is a, a like a governing agency to approve drugs. So they are really concerned about you know the waste of money of those drugs uh, trials, but they are not very applicable to the rural population. So we are interested in looking at ways to assess you know, drug eligibility trials. And uh, in, usually, in, when you compare the trial of and the eligibility, you have different types of methods. So um, one type of method is to compare how well your study sample, which is an enrolled patient, uh, representing the target population, which is the patient that you're actually taking this medicine. Another technique is to compare the other population, with, which is, um, in our definition, is the population that can be characterized by the criteria. Even if they're not enrolled in trials, they can use, still use criteria for example, you have to have age less than 30 years old, you have to have different technology, you can use that kind of criteria to categorize to a target population. And then if you compare that population to a target population, you can somewhat assess the general eligibility trials. And we found that there are some existing techniques. As I mentioned, they can use a study sample, compare that with target population to compare the uh, target eligibility. They will also look at um, you know, the eligibility criteria frequency to look at whether um, particular criteria are frequently used or not in, um, in trial recruitment. So um, those are different types of methods. But we found that uh, even if the literature of trial eligibility is very rich, but the methods of poorly organized and reproducibility and validity are not very um, you know, solidified. So we want to test, uh, you know, evaluate their validity, reproducibility, and also organize in them in a more systematic way. Um, and also, uh, we found that most of these drug eligibility assessments are done after trial conclusion. And the idea is, um, the problem is, if you finish a trial recruitment and uh, you test how generalized for the result, usually that is not very useful because uh, you cannot change that, like, the trial recruitment anymore. You have to kind of uh, find a way to generalize the results, and that's not very good in compared to look at your trial design in the beginning and figure out ways to improve that before you recruit a single patient. So we want to find ways to define, to develop this type of new tool that can help people better uh, assess their job ability the of trials, but they are really doing that. So it's very difficult to get a nice grant. Uh, as you can imagine, the usual successful rate is roughly less than 10%. So you have to really do a lot of jobs, do a lot of work before you actually go for that particular opportunity. So before we got this R01, R21 grant, we actually published eight conference papers and three journal papers um, to prepare ourselves to prepare ourselves to propose this type of uh, work. And what we did is we developed uh, like a like database using uh, over 200,000 clinical trial summaries from the Go, go, organizing them in a, in, a, in, a, in a database so they can be easily retrieved. We also developed a web visual analytic tool to allow people to use visualization to analyze the population that are being uh, targeted through the analysis of clinical trial eligibility criteria. And we also published a lot of papers in proposing different techniques to assess your eligibility using one metric, using one study trait, or using multiple study traits, 
We also validated some scores. Um, we assess the reliability of different type of trials. We also compare different type of analysis of the reliability. So this kind of technique, this kind of lines of, of uh, lines of work, really help us better understand this problem and prepare uh, like a project that is novel and is important and significant. So we really did a good job in this proposal. Uh, it's only the first submission, and we got it awarded. And it's also very highly um, like, um, like evaluated. We got um, a very good score, 21. Usually the lower, the better. Uh, in each grant, they give you um, different criteria in terms of your significance, your, um, like your approach, your um, team, uh, which is uh, the, the, the investigators, and also environment. We got pretty high score in all of this. And so that kind of ranking, that score gave us uh, the percentile of four percentile, which means that in a whole bunch of like proposals, roughly a hundred proposals, our proposal was ranked top four percent among all of them. So it was found in the beginning, in the first in the first attempt, which is great. So it allowed us to use two years or even three years to do this project and sort of potentially prepare for the next project. So we have two specific aims in this project. And the first aim. We want to systematically review and evaluate the Google Cloud Joint Ability Assessment Methods. And by systematic review, we mean that we want to create a taxonomy for these type of methods and evaluate the validity of these methods using real-world patient population data. Um, and also, we want to assess how can we uh, associate with prior joint ability assessment with the health outcome of patients in the general health population. And the secondary aim, we want to develop a toolbox, uh, which includes also um, user-friendly investigator guidelines and uh, uh, tutorial to help them better evaluate the clinical challenges. So if you don't know the assessment, that's fine. If you use this toolbox, you will find the appropriate tools and appropriate statistical software. And you can also have, uh, like, to, uh, using the tutorial to go through the process easily to follow that and be able to do the assessment. So I hope this will have some impact in the, in the community. So this is a general like framework. And then we'll just quickly go through some of the results we found. Um, uh, in the past two and a half years, actually, before even before we got this grant, we already started this systematic review. And uh, the experience from me is that it's very, very time consuming to do a systematic review if you want to do something great. And we started this, actually, this project back in 2017, so it's already almost two years. And initially, I worked with uh, uh, a student in our master program uh, a Kelsa Bartley, who is right now working at University of Miami, and uh, she's a medical librarian. At that time, she worked with me through the direct independent study, and we started to look at this problem. And later on, because we want to make this uh, like a publishable paper, so we invested more, much more time in that. So we can see from this uh, record screening process um, through uh, identifying the record from different databases like PubMed, uh, single hole, cochrane, second hole, we found 3,500 papers that could potentially be uh, included in this review. So you can imagine how time consuming it would be to manually go through this uh, 3,000 papers. So we have to go through several rounds following the Prisma like flowchart. So Prisma, this kind of flowchart is a standardized uh, standard review of guideline. Um, if you want to have a paper published in medical journals, you have to follow some kind of like a guideline like this. So we first of all do um, find records from the databases, we merge this record for looking duplicates, and then we screen this record by re re reviewing its titles and abstract and removing some irrelevant ones, and then we read the full text. So after removing 3,000 papers, 3,200 records, we review uh, 290 papers um, you know, full text, and then we follow our inclusion exclusion criteria, and finally included 187 papers for review. So this is our inclusion and exclusion criteria. I won't go too much detail about this. I just want to give you a like, brief idea about how we do this. But here are some you know, results I want to quick show, quickly show. And this shows how uh, and how many papers are published each year? So you can see that there's an increasing trend of control generalizability over time. And because our literature search only uh, includes papers published in, uh, till I think March of 2019, so the bar of 2019 is pretty low, which is understandable. And I'm also looking at disease areas of those particular um, like disease that are focused. And we found that most focused disease, including cancer, cardiovascular disease, mental diseases, which are you know, understandable because they are really highly prevalent, and some of them are really uh, the leading causes of death in the states. And also, we look at 
if they are particularly focused on one particular subgroup of the population. We found that among those 27 papers that focus on particular subgroups, um, most of them are focusing on elderly children um, and also they're investigating potentially gender disparities and ethnicity disparities. And we'll categorize them into different uh, categories. Uh, we'll build this taxonomy of joint healing assessment methods and we use different dimensions like time perspective in terms of what kind of uh, assessment can be done at what time. Uh, for example, if you don't have trial recruitment results, you can use a criteria to do uh, prior joint healing assessment. If you have a reported patient population, you can do posterior joint healing assessment. And then we look at the trial results format, whether the result of joint healing is represented using a quantitative score or not a quantitative score. And then we we'll look at what kind of populations are being considered comparing, whether we're comparing trial participants with non participants, or comparing trial participants with eligible patients or ineligible patients. So there are different combinations of comparisons we can analyze. So we found that most papers are looking at post general post ability, which means that they're looking at the reported patients' population and comparing them with the general population. And uh, this figure shows the trend of different type of comparisons over time. And uh, you know, even if both a priori and a posteriori are increasingly um, used, uh, still the priori is more uh, is more used than the priori. And we'll look at also the scale of target population. Um, because the joint field assessment is that uh, the general idea is you compare the patients uh, that are eligible or enrolled in trials and then compare it with the real world population, which will reference observational database. So the scale of the observational database uh, somewhat determines how rigorous your particular assessment is. If the uh, target population is bigger, it's larger, it means your assessment is actually more, uh, more uh, valid. So um, over time, we found that uh, more and more national data are being used, potentially because we have uh, national efforts to construct large database, observational database, including, for example, the Patients and Outcome Research Institute, Hikari, uh, established this uh, clinical um, data research network, CDRN, which are particular data hubs. Like in Florida, we have this one Florida data trust, which includes 22 million patient data in this big data warehouse. So if you make this data database available, that can be readily used for patient population um, and uh, profile. And we we'll also look at whether they um, you know, uh, produce a general election, well, whether the conclusion is that the trial is generalizable, these were not generalizable. We found that most of them are saying the trials are not generalizable, which, which is kind of uh, like uh, expected because um, the generalizability has been a big concern in communities. And we we'll also compare whether a particular um, negative result come from the assessment for single trials or multiple trials. We found that usually negative uh, conclusions usually come from assessment of multiple trials. And for single trials, some of, uh, most of them are actually appraising the generalizability of the single trials. So we also see what kind of populations are being compared. Uh, most of them comparing the trial participant with general population, and some of them compare the trial participant with the non-participant. So um, we also categorize that. We also categorize what kind of uh, like characteristics or different type of information are being compared in this assessment, general assessment, and what kind of statistical tests are being used in this assessment. Um, and uh, it's also not surprising that chi-square tests are often used for comparing the categorical variable, like the race, or gender, and the t-tests are usually used to compare the work variable, like age, or the other type of lab test results. And for example, um, this, this figure shows an example comparison. So if you compare age uh, between the eligible patients with the non-standard non eligible patients, they are using um, uh, many weighted tests. Uh, if you're comparing the, like, the gender disparities uh, between these populations, they are using uh, the feature graph test because the sample size is not very big. Um, and then there are several different tests that can be used to make the, um, uh, assess the differences. And also, some, there are some techniques that are used to predict or assess the risk factors associated with uh, participation or non-participation. And some of the techniques, like propensity score matching or propensity score weighting, are intended to estimate, estimate the bias, uh, society, the bias of selection. So if you use propensity score weighting or matching, you can potentially um, uh, kind of uh, like assess how different, um, how restrictive of the criteria is um, if you compare the difference. You can also use propensity score weighting to um, make your trial results more generalizable. So if you weight your trial participants 
based on the what is uh, like population line and the general population, they can um, you know results can potentially to be more applicable. So um, we also can uh, summarize that. The user result for this. Uh, we also look at how can we compare patient outcomes. Like if we'll compare treatment effect or uh, outcomes. Uh, the Cox proportional hazard model is often used, uh, followed by log trend or Motex Cox method. Um, and if you compare like adverse events or survivals, um, you can use uh, if you use, uh, so compare survivals and mortality of patients, you can use a Kaplan mirror estimate and draw this um, survival curve. So you can compare like for example how many days will a patient likely to survive over time if you compare the how high to the general population. And in, from this paper, they said there were no difference in overall survival between clinical trial and real world patients. But the treatment duration was significantly shorter in, in, uh, in clinical uh, uh, practices compared with the clinical trials. So we also um, you know, look at ways to assess generalizability before they can recruit even patient. And we developed some methods like including generalizability index for steady traits and a multivariate gist and several variations to assess the quantified variability. Um, and this paper compares the frequency of LHB criteria used in different type of trials. And uh, like GIST 2.0 is a scalable, like uh, scalable multivariate metric to assess transitability. And the idea is that if you use patient population data and set variables um, that patients uh, don't have missing traits, um, and then you uh, like uh, summarize the trait with multiple readings, assessing the mean value, mean value, latent value, and then you can identify the disease that you want to focus on as a population that can represent your population uh, using a, like, a data set. And then you can extract control summaries from the uh, uh, and uh, uh, identify the trial, like uh, the criteria in certain trials, and then using this particular metric called GIST point zero to quantify the transitability of the trials. So based on that, we want to evaluate the methods validity using real world data. So this particular small study, what we did is that we want to analyze um, what is the correlation between uh, joint CPT uh, score with the clinical outcome with a particular treatment. And we hypothesize that if you are in eligible for trials, you are more likely, you are less likely to have serious adverse drug reactions compared to those patients who don't who are not eligible for trials. And then we, in this particular study, we use caloric as a trials of that's a soup map, um, which is, uh, has a trade network avastin. And this avastin drug is the first uh, monoclonal uh, antibody as tumor starving therapy uh, approved by FDA to treat metastasis uh, for cancer. So in general, uh, in this data analysis project, we found 50 million patients. Initially, we looked at 50 million, million patients in one floor data, data trust. And then we identified those patients with colorectal cancer diagnosis, which include all, about 40,000 and we further look at whether they have taken this disease or not. This is a chemotherapy, so they have procedural code. And then for those people who have taken this medicine or uh, chemotherapy, we found um, 2,500. Uh, 2, and then um, we use uh, the allergic criteria of those trials to subdivide them into patients who are eligible or patients who are not eligible. So we want to use the patients who are eligible to assess the eligibility and then use this population with patients who are taking this medicine as a target population uh, when we do the assessment. And we identify serious adverse reaction, drug reactions uh, from the medical record using the diagnosis code ICD-10, ICD-9C and code. And these drug reactions, drug reactions are reported in the drug label of those uh, of the uh, vaccine. And then um, we use a time, time frame between the time when they first diagnosed with colorectal cancer, the first time they're taking the best SUMAP uh, procedure to 180, 180 days after they're taking the last medicine as the uh, like time frame to detect the occurrences of a serious drug reactions and drug reactions. And they would develop this metric called uh, patient trial joinability. And the idea is for one particular patient, we can um, assess, for example, whether a patient is eligible for a trial or not by using this binary variable to detect its eligibility and using this variable to assess, uh, to uh, evaluate uh, this variable is a joint C score, which is just 0 0.0 score of the trial. And then if you multiply that, basically you need the higher this score, the, the more patient, uh, the more trial uh, this patient is eligible for and the higher eligibility this patient uh, uh, and we use um, a zero inflated negative polynomial model to a zero inflated, uh, instead of a zero inflated poison uh, regression model 
to assess their correlations uh, because the variance in the outcome is not much larger than the mean value. Um, and basically, our outcome variable is the number of uh, serious drug reactions, serious uh, adverse drug reactions, and our predictor including the general activity score of a trial, uh, and also number of procedures this person take, the days of follow-up from the latest procedure, and also the patient demographic information like age, gender, and sex. And based on our demographic um, of data, we found that most people don't have any serious drug reactions, serious drug adverse drug reactions, and only four, uh, 500 out of 2,500 2, have some kind of like a serious drug reactions. And uh, we use uh, the top eligibility criteria to determine the eligibility of those patients in these trials. And we only use four trials to, to um, do the comparison. So basically, for each trial, we compute its um, uh, MG score, the Javascript score, and the number of serious drug reactions among the other patients and knowledge professions. So um, in general, um, we found some interesting association. We found that the patient, the female, has a higher probability of having serious adverse reactions than male patients. Uh, if you hold other predictors constant, we also found that the number of uh, procedures increasing by one, the odds of having no serious drug reaction decreases by 0.049, which means that if you are taking more, like uh, if you are doing more procedure, you are more likely to have adverse drug reactions. Um, and also found that higher uh, CPDG, which is a patient trial drug score, would lead to a smaller number of zero uh, adverse drug reactions. This is our later finding. In that case, in, with that conclusion, we found that if you have a better generalizability in trials, the patients uh, in the trial will have a less uh, possibility like um, a serious drug reaction in the real world. So, um, so this is our major finding. Um, the patients who are eligible for original trials have a better treatment outcome compared with those who are not eligible in real world practice. And the patients who are more similar to the study population trials used to develop in treatment will have a significantly lower possibility to experience serious uh, adverse drug, drug events. And we do have some implications from these studies. It shows that we could use some real world evidence data so, especially from medical record to assess patient uh, clinical outcomes and examine various patient characteristics associated with these outcomes. We also build the evidence to support the development of a clinical trial eligibility criteria design so that we can use this kind of uh, assessment methods to improve and optimize the study generalizability. Um, they also lead to opportunities to develop some suitable uh, criteria design tool for cohort identification and for to facilitate trial. And that is uh, everything um, I want to present this morning. Um, and uh, I gracious, uh, gracious, uh, graciously uh, um, would like to thank our support from different sources to support this type of research. And we could use this research um, grant to support students' uh, uh, assistantship here. And uh, that is everything that I want to present this morning. Um, hope that you have learned something at least. Thank you. So any questions? So how do you ensure that the, that your sample population is it's a representative of the general population? How do you how do you ensure that you attract people for the clinical trial that is representative of your general population? I mean, we cannot ensure that, so that's why right. we're trying to quantify that. One one uh, like develop some techniques to help people better um, assess their differences. So that before um, you know, our technique is that we could. Uh, not only use the patients in the recording by trials to assess the difference, we could also use your uh, selection criteria. So before you even for the patients, we could try to use your, uh, for example, your selection criteria, like your age is between a certain age frame. Right, so you define your, 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 criteria, your inclusion criteria right. for the clinical trial. Right. But then how do you ensure that the people that you want, that you need, because the people that go to the clinical trial are the people that would tend to go to the clinical trial. We, we're more inclined to go into the clinical trial normally, right? Right. Uh -huh. And that's what we have so far, always a, like a sample population that is pretty um, homo homogenous, right? Like usually, like historically, in clinical yeah. trials. Yeah. So now we need a more diverse population. So you, you get your criteria and you narrow it down. But then it's on the side of the population to come, though. That's Kind of like right. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. But um, I would say there is a justifiable reason for doing uh, for using those restricted criteria because yeah, I, I mean, if you want to test the efficacy of a trial of a drug in a particular disease, 
uh, you probably don't want to have patients with other diseases or other type of sick problems, right. right? Because you know you don't know whether that could be a chronic factor. You don't want to also include patients who are taking other type of medicine. Right. You know, but but you have different. more control over that. Yeah. Because yeah. that if, if if you have a, a sample, then you can assess for those for those criteria. But right. in, in terms of um, gender, ethnicity, and other variables that right. you know for underrepresented. Uh, populations, I guess that's what's that's what's hard. Yeah, it's really hard. So that's why when we review the literature of those 187 papers, we didn't find many papers. Uh, they're using, uh, you know, they're developing novel techniques to assess the joint ability using the criteria. What they do is mostly they look at their recruited patients and then they compare, for example, you know, recruit patients. What is the distribution from patients uh, for the age? For the gender, for different kind of characteristics, and they compare with the general population. They say, okay, maybe uh, by looking at this result, we found that the patients in the in the in the, in the clinical trials are much younger than patients in the real, real world. Right. So, given whoever came, then you right. can uh, uh, group them. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, in the future, I definitely feel like there's opportunity to help people better make uh, better decisions with the design criteria. Because right now, what they're doing is that okay, we just don't want to include this type of patients. But some of these trial criteria are not very um, justified. Um, right. You need to have a better way to assess, even if, for example, we could, even for patients who are older, they may be safely enrolled. Um, but you know, if you ignore them, they will never be able to enroll. But we can use other ways to um, kind of uh, excluding those factors that may be profound factors for trial. Right. That's perfect.